One of the challenges that we face internally with our witness for Christ and with our churches, the, the challenge is to remember that we're not wiser than God. Remember that we are not more just than God. And I know that it almost seems silly to say that, but there are a lot of people who get embarrassed about parts of the Old Testament or the New Testament. Compounded with that is an error. This is a big highfalutin. We are anti-law, okay? It's the error that we throw out the entire Old Testament. We throw out the entire law of God. We throw it out. We're under the new covenant, not the old covenant. And so the, there's nothing in the Old Testament that's binding on us. That is an error. Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the law. He said, I came to fulfill it. Now, clearly, there are types and shadows of the Old Testament that pointed towards Christ's coming, such as the Passover lamb, where they would kill the lamb and they would sprinkle the blood in the form of a cross, by the way, over their doorposts, right? That was a type. It was a shadow. And we no longer kill the Passover lamb. So things like that, the book of Hebrews makes clear we have done away with. But we haven't done away with thou shalt not murder. We haven't done away with thou shalt not steal. We haven't done away with thou shalt not commit adultery. We haven't done away with thou shalt honor thy mother and father. We haven't done away with these things. And the, the New Testament says that the things that are there are written for us, for our instruction. There's passages where Paul talks about rightly dividing the word of truth. There's passages where Paul talks about us knowing how the man of God should act, studying the scriptures. Well, at the time that Paul wrote that, the only scriptures they had were the Old Testament. You understand that? The New Testament wasn't canonized until the late 300s. So when Paul was writing and referring to the scriptures and talking about the law of God, talking about the role of the scriptures in public life, in Romans 13, all of this, he was referring to the Old Testament. I'm telling you this because you might be going to one of those churches. <clears throat> and if you are, if you're committed to staying there, you know, that's your decision, that's your right to do. But don't be poisoned by that particular lie, by that particular heresy, by that particular error, okay? Now, the reason I set the table like this is because we need to use some Old Testament examples. I want to talk to you about the critical nature of top-down leadership, whether for good or for evil. For example, I encourage you to read the book of Judges. The book of Judges is almost an archetype of the history of the human race. You see covenantal blessings, you see covenantal chastenings or punishments going up and down, up and down. The people of the land did evil in the sight of the Lord and the Lord handed them over to their enemies. You see Deborah coming and you see Gideon coming, right? You see various judges coming, but <clears throat> what was one of the elements that the judges or the deliverers had in common? They told the people, stop sinning. And before God allowed Gideon to deliver the Jews from the Midianites, it's recorded in Judges chapter 6, before he allowed Gideon to do that, Gideon was required to tear down the idol that was in his dad's front yard. Now, <clears throat> let's fast forward to Solomon. Solomon was the son of David. Solomon was uh, the wisest king who ever lived on the planet until King Jesus, right? Israel prospered under his rule. He wrote significant portions of the scriptures. He was a good king, and he asked God for wisdom. God gave it to him. He didn't ask for money. He didn't ask for long life. He didn't ask for the life of his enemies. He asked for wisdom to know how to lead. God was pleased with him. And God came and filled the temple with his Shekinah glory. But then Solomon became corrupt. It says that he married many wives, foreign wives, who turned his heart away from the Lord. And what did Solomon do? 
Did you know that Solomon actually offered one of his children to a pagan god in fire? He offered one of his own children as a burnt offering to a pagan deity. That's one of the most horrific moments in all of human history when a man so graced by God with wisdom from God, the presence of God, that he would be that corrupted by his pagan wives and fall that far away. It's almost unthinkable. Now God chastened him and he returned to the Lord and the ancient church still refers to him as Saint Solomon, believe it or not. <clears throat> But he gives an example because what follows after Solomon is what we're going to talk about when we come back from this break. And it's like an, it's like an archetype of the purpose of civil government, the role of civil government, of leaders, for the ill of people and for the corruption of morals or for the good of people and for the reformation of morals. Please stay with me. Don't go away. <laughs> out of the hands of wicked and unjust men and women who are destroying the republic before our eyes and put leadership back into the hands of righteous men and women so that we don't die as a nation? Well, you're talking about social revolution and there are rules in social revolution. We can look at the victorious social revolutions of the past, such as the end of slavery, the end of child labor, women's voting rights, the end of segregation, and so much more, and learn from their victories. Look at their actions, their images, their rhetoric, their sacrifices, and their final fruit. We will send you this series that originally cost $129, seven books for students, one teacher's guide, if you'll give a gift of any size and just pay for shipping and handling. Take advantage of it today. <laughs>